Okay, here we go. I think it's likely that this is going to take two, maybe three more videos to wrap up, but we're going to plow straight ahead and, and try to get through as much of the birth of tragedy as we can. Um, the textbook that we're using for this, uh, this course uh, only contains the first 15 sections, so the last 15 se or last 10 sections uh, are left out. I'll maybe comment a little bit on them. Uh, in the concluding video, but uh, in this video, a uh, bit of it's a recap of what we've already covered before, uh, so it'll get back to sort of where we left off in the last one, and then we're going to get into, uh, I guess the recap is sort of birth of tragedy, how did tragedy come about, and how did it uh, evolve uh, throughout uh, uh, Greek art, starting with the Homeric poetry, the epic poetry, uh, and sort of winding its way through uh, uh, lyric poetry, of Archilochus and the folk song, and then eventually springing from a Dionysian chorus, uh, merging with a uh, tragic play. So we're going to cover that or sort of recap in a bit, really quick at the beginning here, and then we're going to dive into uh, an examination of the death of tragedy, right? Once we recap the birth, we'll see how tragedy, Greek tragedy, uh, as Nietzsche sees it, dies. And a lot of the blame has to go to Euripides, who is a uh, one of the kind of the three uh, heavyweights of Greek tragedy that, that uh, at least that has survived uh, posterity. Uh, that would be Aeschylus, who we talked about in previous videos, Sophocles, and then Euripides, finally, who we'll, we'll, we'll get into uh, later on. So this, this video, again, the beginning of the death of tragedy through, through Euripides. Oh, and the birth of comedy uh, after that. Uh, there's a, a relationship between the two. And the next video, I think it might be the last video, we'll see. And uh, we'll continue our uh, examination of Euripides and uh, the death of tragedy and then uh, hopefully kind of, you know, wind things down a bit, okay? So let's read this first quote here. Uh, again, this is a bit, a bit, a bit of a recap here uh, in the essay. We've already pointed out that the Homeric epos is the poem of the Olympian culture in which this culture has sung its own victory or its song of victory over the terror of the War of the Titans. So remember we were talking earlier, I think the second video about how uh, the Olympian pantheon of Homer, right, the Zeus and, and Hera and Apollo and uh, Dionysus even, um, all the great Olympic gods overthrowing the Titans, you know, for him represents uh, the replacement of sort of a more austere and, and, and impersonable worldview of the Titans, right? These forces of nature with the more personable, more joyful uh, the the thearchy is the word he uses, right? Uh, or you might call theology um, of the Olympic gods, which were more reflective of ourselves and, you know, for him a more satisfactory way of dealing with our existence and finding meaning uh, if we find it reflected in the gods themselves, okay? So we already saw this, right? We already saw how that happens. Uh, under the pro predominating influence of tragic poetry, these Homeric myths are now born anew. So in, the, in uh, Greek tragedy, they're reborn. And this me uh, metempsychosis, that in the meantime, the Olympian culture also has conquered by a deeper view of things. So for him, the Greek tragedy, um, it's a deeper view in some sense. It's more honest, it's more direct. It faces Silenus in the face. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you probably watched the earlier video where we go over the legend of Silenus. But basically, uh, the dreadfulness of existence, right? Uh, the trials and tribulations of existence. It's not as naive as the Olympian answer, which kind of finds this fantasy world, uh, these you know, super powerful gods, but it looks life's problems directly in the face and celebrates them in art, right? In this Apollonian display of beauty and art. Okay, so the philosophy of wild and naked culture beholds with the frank, undissembling gaze of truth the myth of the Homeric world as they dance past. They turn pale, they tremble under the piercing glance of this goddess, till the powerful fist of the Dionysian artist forces them into the service of the new deity. Dionysian truth takes over the entire domain of myth as a symbolism of its knowledge. This is what makes known partly in the public cult of tragedy and partly in the secret celebration of the dramatic mysteries, but always in the old mythical garb. 
Okay, we're not going to talk much about the dramatic mysteries. This interesting phenomenon of the ancient Greek world, right? The, the mystery cults of Dionysius and all this. I've got sort of statues here of a uh, modern art installation depicting some of these, these, these rites of Dionysius. Okay? <clears throat> but um, the point he's making here, again, is that there's this sort of uh, different stance that is represented in the tragic uh, uh, poetry of, you know, the, the Greek stage. Uh, something different than the Homeric epic, right? Uh, Dionysius is a dominant force, right? The Dionysian is a dominant force, and the ordering of the plot and, and all this is a direct sort of manifestation of this, right? Uh, it makes itself known in partly in this cult, uh, but partly in, in these dramatic uh, mysteries, uh, but always in a mythical garb, right? Always in, in, in the guise of myth, right? These old myths, these old Olympian myths, take on a more direct and more uh, visceral, you might say, uh, guise in Greek tragedy. So what allowed this to happen? And again, this is a bit of a recap of previous videos. You know, he asked, you know, what power was it that freed Prometheus from his vultures and transformed the myth into a vehicle of Dionysian wisdom? It is the Heraclean power of music, which having reached its highest manifestation in tragedy, can invest myths with a new and most profound significance. This we have already characterized as the most powerful function of music, right? So it was through the, the, the Dionysian dithyram, uh, you know, sort of this, this melodic primal urge to sing, uh, the song of nature, right? From our bowels, from our guts out, right? To make this manifest, right? This is what allowed uh, the birth of tragedy uh, to come forth from the spirit, from the spirit of music, right? And, and, and in this sense, I think Nietzsche, again, we talked about this are, uh, enough, I think, in previous videos, like, I won't dwell on it too much here, but I think this, this does show a bit of influence from Schopenhauer. Uh, I think, you know, I spent a whole video, one of the longest videos I did on, on my Schopenhauer series, uh, just on his view of music, how important it is, and for Schopenhauer, it's a direct uh, reflection of the will. Um, so anyway, so Nietzsche's akin to Schopenhauer in that sense, right? So music, the, you know, trying to make itself known through poetry uh, establishes the possibility of the dithyrambic chorus, the Dionysian chorus, uh, which paired together with this Apollonian play of the, the old Olympian myths uh, gave birth to tragedy. <clears throat> okay, so how does this have to fit into religion and history? And we, I think we've already talked a bit about this in previous videos, but it, it, it bears emphasis, because I think this is something that is unique to Nietzsche, that I think is, is, is an innovation over, over Schopenhauer, right? Um, you know, how, how does our art reflect a worldview? How does it relate to our religious views? Um, and are there parallels? So he says, this is the way in which religions are wont to die out when under the stern, intelligent eyes of an orthodox dogmatism, the mythical premises of religion are systemized as a sum total of historical events. When one begins apprehensively to defend the credibility of the myths, while at the same time one opposes any continuation of their natural vitality and growth, when accordingly the feeling for myth perishes and its place is taken by the claim of religion to historical foundations. This dying myth was now seized by the newborn genius of Dionysian music, and in these hands it flourished yet again, with color such as it had never yet displayed, with a, fra a fragrance that awakened a long anticipation of a metaphysical world. Okay, so we've already spoken about how through, through um, Greek tragedy uh, and this Dionysian element, uh, the, the, the Dionysian element in the Greek chorus, you know, through that, the Olympic myths were able to be reinvigorated and reborn, okay? But what was going on here? He just seems to be saying that there was an old religion that was go growing stale, that was no longer serving its purpose, that was no longer serving its function, I suppose, right? It wasn't providing, I guess, the Greek culture with that answer to Silenus that it needed, that, 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 that answer to the unbearable weight of, of our miserable existence, right? So pessimistic sounding, uh, but that's the point, right? Um, so what is it that makes religion go stale? In this quote, he seems to be saying that it dies under a stern, intelligent eye of orthodox dogmatism. So when it becomes systematized, right, uh, into a sum total of historical events. So when the Homeric 
poems, right, the Homeric epics, were started to be treated as history, as literal truths, instead of reflections of, you know, inner passions of us, right, as, as, as uh, articulations of uh, universal human truths, reflections of the human condition, but instead uh, taken literally as historic events and defended in such ways as a historian would defend them. Um, and, 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 and you oppose, you know, once that happens, one opposes any, uh, what Nietzsche calls a continuation of their natural vitality and growth. You know, for him, a religion supposedly, you know, I guess in its proper form, right, uh, has a vitality and growth to it, uh, which I guess, you know, perhaps is, is, is morphous, right? Amorphous. So <clears throat> when according to the, the feeling from it perishes, right, when, when there's no longer that, that connection, um, and its place is taken the claim by, by the claim of religion to historical foundations. Right, we're looking for you know, you know, like, you know, like some Christians today look for archaeological evidence of biblical uh, events and things like this. Right, uh, you know, Nietzsche would would scoff at that too, I suppose. This dying myth was now seized by the newborn genius of Dionysian music. So in a way, this spirit of music, Dionysian music in particular, this dithyrambic, uh, passionate, spontaneous, melodic uh, music. Uh, was able to capture and grasp a hold of these old myths and give them new life and reinvigorate them by setting them in a new, more visceral and direct and honest, uh, uh, maybe even more bleak, uh, uh, but, but ecstatic, I suppose, intoxicating light. Okay, and what this shows is, is he says, this, uh, 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 the fact that in these hands it flourished yet again with colors as it never displayed before, with the fragrance that awakened an anticipation of a metaphysical world. So there was, there was a need for this. There was a longing anticipation for a new metaphysics, right? For a new theology, right? After this final effulgence, it collapses, okay? So it's gonna die, right? We already mentioned in this video, we're gonna get to the death of tragedy. Its leaves wither. And soon the mocking Lucians, here's a uh, engraving of Lucian. Uh, the mocking Lucians of antiquity catch at the discolored and faded flowers carried away by the four winds. We, we don't know much about Lucien, but apparently he was one of these, the first Greek to write a sort of treatise where he kind of mocked the Greek religion. And we really believe that there's a guy who p p pulls the sun around the earth in a chariot, come on, right? Um, so he's sort of one of these first, you know, public intellectual skeptics. Uh, he's famous for this, right? So for Nietzsche, he thinks, and I mentioned this already, Euripides, uh, uh, Euripides, the tragic poet, was really the guy who, who, you know, put the last nail in the coffin for tragedy, right? He really sealed the fate of Greek tragedy. He essentially killed, you know, what Nietzsche would call its Dionysian elements, and uh, as much as possible, right? For Nietzsche, you can't completely eliminate the Dionysian from art. You know, it's always going to be there at the base, at, you know, it's, it's sort of there, it's kind of a subtraining element. It's not sort of, it's not, it's not as front and center as it is in the Greek tragedy, but it's always going to be there, even in the naive art of Homer, right? And, and again, you can review previous videos where I, I go into more details of this, right? So under Euripides' hands, uh, his ruthless hands, uh, tragedy died, right? <clears throat> so here's a bust of Euripides, and so he says, uh, he's talking to Euripides here, you know, under myth, Sorry, and as myth died in thy hands, so too died the genius of music. So remember, music was this essential element, this sort of primal element that brought out the lyric poetry of Archilochus, right? He was putting it in poetic form, but it was very melodic, and then this morphs into, you know, the folk song and, and so on and so forth. We talked more about that in the previous video. Um, but he, you know, it died, right? Now it's greedily plunder all the gardens of music, right? All the, all the, the, the blossoms, all the fruit that was born from this process, right? He just went and squandered it. Thou didst attain, but a counterfeit masked music. And as thou hast forsaken Dionysius, Dionysus, Apollo hath also forsaken thee. So Nietzsche doesn't think he's a very good artist, right? When you forsake Dionysius and try to go strictly Apollonian, um, it's not always going to be effective. He's very, very critical of uh, Euripides as an artist. And, and I don't know, I, I like Euripides. I, I like to read the Bakhti and some of his work, so I don't know. But I, I, we'll get to some of the details in the next video about Euripides and what the problem is with what's so bad about him. And uh, I think Euripides' plays read well to, to the modern 
uh, reader. So maybe that's why I like Euripides. But when one imagines them being performed, I think Nietzsche might have a, a, a point. The, uh, there's this lack of spontaneity, perhaps, uh, that, that was in the earlier, earlier tragedy. Right, so thou hast forsaken Dionysius, so Apollo, Apollo hath also forsaken thee. Rouse up all the passions from their haunts and conjure them into thy circle. Sharpen and wet thy sophistical dialectic to the speeches of thy heroes. Thy, ver thy very heroes have but counterfeit masked passions and utter but counterfeit masked worlds. So he thinks there's something artificial about the art of Euripides, okay? So in a sense, the way tragedy died was suicide since the person who killed it was a tragic poet. So Greek tragedy meant an indifferent from that of her older sister art. She died by suicide in consequence of an irreconcilable conflict. Accordingly, she died tragically. While all the others passed away calmly and beautifully at a ripe old age, if it be consonant with the happy natural state to take leave of life easily, leaving behind a fair posterity, the closing period of these older arts exhibits such a happy natural state Slowly they sink from sight, and before their dying eyes already stand their fairer progeny, who impatiently, with a bold gesture, lift up their heads. Right. So when the Homeric epic died, it was it was graceful, right? It morphed into a lyric song. You know, there, there was a sort of, a, and we skipped over this part, but there was, you know, the the hymns of people like uh, um, oh, the name is, is is escaping me, Pindar, right? The hymns of Pindar, and then the lyric songs, and and, and so as one art dies. There's sort of, it has a child, right? A baby that resembles it, that is influenced by it. And sort of, you know, the, the torch is passed on. Not so much with tragedy, right? When Greek tragedy died, there arose everywhere the immense feeling of a deep void. Just as the Greek sailors in the time of Tiberius once heard upon a lonesome island, the thrilling, great, the, the thrilling cry, great Pan is dead. So now through the Hellenic world, there sounded the grievous lament, tragedy is dead. Poetry has perished with her. And so what art form um, rises in the wake of tragedy's destruction? For Nietzsche, it's comedy, he claims, what, what's called the new attic comedy, right? And when after this death, a new art blossomed forth, which revered tragedy as her ancestress and mistress, it was observed with horror that she did indeed bear the features of her mother, but they were the very features the latter had exhibited in her long death struggle. The later art is known as the New Attic Comedy. In it, the degenerate form of tragedy lived on as a monument of its painful and violent death. Like the de de degenerate form of tragedy, the Euripidean form, right? You remember, Nietzsche doesn't like Euripides, very critical of his, his style, of his, his approach to tragedy. He's very non-Dionysian, tries to extract the Dionysian elements. Okay? And so for him, this new art was copying the baddest parts of tragedy, okay? Um, the very latter, the, 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 sorry, the very features that the tragedy had exhibited during its long death struggle. And who's the blame for this? Again, Euripides, right? The birth of comedy through Euripides. The spectator now actually saw and heard his double, right? So this is how, this is what, this is where Nietzsche sees in Euripides the birth of comedy. What elements in the Euripidean play tragic play are different from the earlier tragic poets and what about them gives rise to the comedic well here we begin his explanation right the spectator now actually saw and heard his double on the Euripidean stage and rejoiced that he could talk so well but this joy was not all you could even learn of Euripides how to how to speak he prides himself upon this in his contest with Aeschylus that's a reference to Aristophanes. There's a, a comedy uh, by Aristophanes called The uh, the Frogs, where they go down to Hades and uh, they see all the old poets or the old tragedians who have just recently died. And, and uh, yeah, Euripides and Aeschylus are having a contest down there. And he says that, uh, you know, he teaches the people how to speak, right? So from, from him, the people have learned how to observe, debate, draw conclusions according to the rules of art and with the cleverest sophistries. In general, through this revolution of the popular speech, he made the new comedy possible, right? So what does he do, right? He brings the commonplace to stage, right? Instead of getting these great, royal, tragic figures like um, 
Oedipus, and I suppose Prometheus was a god, so it's not just a royalty, right? But now we get the common, right? The commoner, right? <clears throat> For henceforth there was no longer a secret how, and with what wise maxim the commonplace was to express itself on the stage. Civic mediocrity, on which Euripides built all his political hopes, was now given a voice. Where heretofore the demigod in tragedy and the drunken satyr and any man in comedy has determined the character of language, right? So now the common folk are um, given eloquence that they never once had before. They're no longer side characters or sort of, you know, uh, uh, prop, stage props, right? Uh, they're given more of a voice. If now, and so this, this is sort of, uh, you know, Euripides, Nietzsche claims, is, is changing the, or trying to, he's trying to, maybe he fails at this, but he's trying to change the spectator. He's trying to um, influence his audience. So if now the entire populace philosophizes, manages lands and goods, and condu conducts lawsuits with unheard of circumspection, the glory is all his together with the splendid results of the wisdom with which he has inoculated the rabble. It was to a populace thus prepared and illuminated that the new comedy could address itself, of which Euripides had become, as it were, the chorus master. Only that this time the chorus of spectators had to be trained. As soon as this chorus was trained to sing in the Euripidean key, there arose that drama which resembles a game of chess. The new comedy, with its perpetual triumphs of cunning and artfulness. But with that, the death of the Hellene had given up his belief in immortality. Not only his belief in an ideal past, but also his belief in an ideal future. The fifth estate, that of the slaves, now comes into power, at least in sentiment. And if we may still speak at all of Greek cheerfulness, that's kind of a you know, stereotype that goes way back. It is the cheerfulness of the slave who has nothing of consequence to be responsible for, nothing great to strive for, and who cannot value anything in the past or future higher than the present, okay? So this is a pretty controversial quote, obviously, for obvious reasons, right? Um, but he's just talking about, again here, we're developing a new worldview. If, if new art forms for him are a reflection of a worldview, right? The Olympian uh, worldview of the Homeric poem, is a triumph over that more dark, bleak, uh, you know, uh, direct maybe and, and awful uh, uh, mythology of the, just the Titans, the Titanic gods. When those get overthrown, this is a more joyful theology of the Olympians. The Greek tragedy is a more honest and direct celebration and yet uh, uh, coming to grips with uh, the terribleness of existence. But what's going on when we get the common people in heart? You know, when, when the fifth estate, as he puts it, uh, comes into power, at least in sentiment, right? Um, we get this notion of cheerfulness that develops that's different from the uh, historical notion of Greek cheerfulness. This is the cheerfulness of the slave. He is um, cheerful because he has nothing of consequence to be responsible for. Just menial tasks of the master, right? Nothing great to strive for, right? He's not like Oedipus trying to be a good and noble king. You know, he's just following orders, right? He can't value anything in the past or future higher than the present. He's not worried about his progeny the way that Oedipus might be uh, or something like this, okay? Again, very politically incorrect, but you kind of have to put your political correctness at the doorstep, I think, when we discuss Nietzsche. Um, but I think he's just also br brutally honest about uh, to the, the perspective that is being you know, put forth. And he's, he's, he's noticing a development in the history of art, right? Um, and he believes this begins with Euripides. Could be wrong about that. So a little bit more about this notion of Greek cheerfulness. To influence of that sentiment, we must describe the fact that the conception of Greek antiqu antiquity, which endured for centuries, Preserve with an almost unconquerable persistency that feverish view of cheerfulness, right? The, 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 sort of the more um, traditional view of the Greek cheerfulness. As if there had never been a sixth century with its birth of tragedy, its mysteries, its Pythagoras and Heraclitus, as if the very artworks of that great period did not exist at all, that these phenomena can hardly be explained as having originated in any such senile and slavish love of existence and cheerfulness, right? So that this earlier historical version of cheerfulness is about as far away from that slave's sort of naive cheerfulness. I hate to use that word naive, but that's, you know, just sort of, uh, well, you know, I don't have much to worry about, but just 
a punitive slave, for, for lack of a better uh, way of explaining it. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so um, this indicates a source of their being an altogether different conception of the world. Okay? So we're looking at life differently. For better or for worse, right? I mean, if you're a slave and you, you, you know, you're, you're just trying to make your life less painful, basically, right? I mean, I would imagine. Right? You're trying to avoid um, the, the burdens of necessity, right? Whereas, I suppose, if you're a royalty or something like this, if you're, if you're an Oedipus, <clears throat> you don't have to worry about all that stuff. That stuff's taken care of for you. But now, now your problems, you know, I guess like today we could talk about first world problems or whatever, right? But this is sort of like the, the problem of the, the, the leader, right? And, you know, how is he going to deal with, you know, the populace and not just the populace, but other, other you know, all the political intrigues that attend his office, okay? Um, but I guess to sort of color this with like the best brush you possibly could to put this in the, the nicest light, the, the least politically incorrect life. This is a good quote from Aristotle, I think, that might demonstrate, <clears throat> in a sense, what, um, what he's just talking about here. Uh, when, he, when, he, when he speaks of, of Greek cheerfulness uh, that he admires versus this sort of just, um, uh, for lack of a better word, slavish cheerfulness, which he doesn't admire, right? The, the, this sort of slavish cheerfulness that you get in the plays of Euripides. Uh, but then, again, this quote from Aristotle, suffering becomes beautiful when anyone bears great calamities with cheerfulness, not through insensibility, but through greatness of mind, okay? So you're, you're dealing with these calamities not because of a lack of depth, right? Which, again, politically incorrect. Um, that's not going to be the Euripidean play. Uh, but but you, you, you bear these calamities because... You have this endurance, right? This virtuous disposition, I suppose. That's probably how Aristotle would put it. So we talked about how Euripides is, uh, you know, not only is he uh, portraying the common folk, but he's trying to train the common folk and, and, and in a sense, uh, maybe appeal to them at the same time uh, and creating a new spectator. Uh, whether he's appealing to them or not, trying to appeal to the common folk or not, is debatable. But Nietzsche thinks there's something a, lot, a little bit more subtle going on um, with Euripides here, right? Is he really concerned with the public? Uh, is that what his, his main focus is? Um, who knows? Well, we're going to answer that question more fully in the next video. But let's, let, let's, let's go with these next few quotes about the public and the relationship between the artist and his public. Um, and then we'll sort of wrap things up and we'll, we'll, we'll take care of all that stuff on the other side. So public, Nietzsche writes, is only a word. In no sense is it a homogenous and constant quantity. So what we call the public, right? What pleases the public is not always going to be constant and homogenous. You know, it's, it's going to change. Which public? The public in France? Public in England? Public in the United States? Right? What, what do you mean by public? Okay. Why should the artist be bound to accommodate himself to a power whose strength lies merely in numbers? And if by virtue of his endowments and aspirations, he should feel himself superior to every one of these spectators, how should he feel with greater respect for the collective expression of all these subordinate capacities than for the relatively high endowed individual spectator? Like, shouldn't he care more about somebody who has taste, really good taste, not just some you know, common folk, right? Again, more snobbery, I suppose, on the... Nietzsche's part. But for Nietzsche, he had a different relation with the public. Again, he wanted to train them. It's not that he was concerned with what they thought. And I guess this is part of his argument, right? He talks about how Aeschylus and Sophocles, right? Here's their bust, right? Aeschylus, the older poet, the writer, uh, we don't think he is anymore. Most scholars dispute this, but he was attributed to writing Prometheus Bound. Wrote, he wrote the Oresteia, right? The trilogy, uh, involving the tragedy of Orestes. And then you have Sophocles, right, who wrote the Oedipal uh, trilogy, right, the Oedipal cycle, right? So they didn't care about the public's claims Nietzsche. They were never concerned. It's beyond, sorry, it is known beyond question that Aeschylus and Sophocles, during their, the whole of their lives, and indeed long after their deaths, were in complete possession of the people's favor, and that therefore, in the case of these forerunners of Euripides, there was never any question of a false relation between artwork and the public. 
What was it then that forcibly drove this artist, so ritually endowed, so constantly impelled to production, from the path warmed by the sun of the greatest names in poetry, and covered by the cloudless heaven of popular flavor? Sorry, favor. What strange consideration for the spectator led him to oppose the spectator? How could he, out of too great respect for his public, despise his public? Euripides, and this is the solution of the riddle just propounded, undoubtedly felt himself as a poet superior to the masses in general. But two of his spectators, he did not feel superior. Sorry, to two of his spectators, he did not feel superior. He brought the masses upon the stage. So he did bring the common folk onto the stage. That doesn't mean he cared about the public. And these two spectators, he revered as the only competent judges and masters of his art. So who were these two? Was it Aeschylus and Euripides? Sorry, he is Euripides, but was it Aeschylus and Sophocles? No, it wasn't Aeschylus and Sophocles. He wasn't thinking of the old masters. Obviously he's changing their style. Poor to Nietzsche, right? He's, he's uh, besmirching their blessed art of Greek tragedy, right? So who are these two spectators? Well, one of them was Euripides himself, right? Of these two spectators, one is Euripides himself. Euripides as a thinker, not as poet. So as, as a sort of intellectual, when he sits back to think about meaning and purpose and the construction of his art, his thought, his intellectual, not the producer, right? So it might be said of him that his copious fund of critical talent, if it do, did not create, right, he, he, he he was critical. We'll see more about this in the next video. What was, the, what was his critical talent? Right? He was a spectator to himself, right? He was looking at his own work, critiquing his own work. Again, a little bit more details on this when we get to the next, the next lecture. <clears throat> but if this critical talent, if it did not create, at least it constantly, constantly stimulated a corresponding and productive artistic impulse. So... Although Nietzsche didn't like his art, he gives him somewhat credit for, for being a bit ingenious and productive and having this impulse to creation. But it was a sort of critical, a theoretical, intellectual um, way of creation. So who is the other spectator, right? If Euripides is the one of the spectators, who is the other one? Well, I guess we'll have to wait to get to the next video for that, to the answer to that question. If you've never read The Birth of Tragedy, then you'll have to wait and see. Um, but you'll find out, and uh, maybe it's not that surprising, but Nietzsche's trying to sort of make you wait, and he's holding you in suspense. So I'll, I'll do the same thing, and I'll, I'll stop it here. I think this is a good, good stopping point anyways, but we'll, we'll pick it up with this long, long quote, uh, which gets into a little bit more detail about um, Euripides himself as the, uh, one, of, one of the spectators. All right, so see you on the other side. Thanks for joining us. See you in a few.